Dion, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for taking the time. Um, just to kick us off, do you want to just give us a, a quick background of your academic and like career progression? Maybe starting off with the A levels you picked, why you picked them, and our butt in just to get some more insights. Yeah, of course. So um, growing up, I've always been sort of a, a more practical person. So I've always enjoyed doing the academic subjects. My parents both teach maths now. So I sort of had had that background. Um, but I've also enjoyed uh, the practical subjects. I did a lot of like product design uh, and DT and that sort of stuff at, at school. Um, I grew up doing woodwork with my dad. So for me, that side is, is, is quite a weird contrast, but I, I enjoy the variation. Yeah. So a level then uh, I picked uh, maths, uh, did business studies, um, and then did uh, product design. Uh, A level, so three very different um, sort of subjects. Yeah, I've also, but I think that describes my interest pretty well in terms of general business entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. uh, the math side, which I think everything needs to be grounded in to some extent, and then yeah, yeah. Um, the product design side, which is probably a little bit my release, something just to sort of take the mind off the the, the other subjects so much. Yeah. Okay, um, and then and then, and then uh, what happened after A levels? Yeah, so I mean, after A levels, the the standard route I went to Devon uh, in in, in Loughton and Devon. So uh, the the push for most people is to go to university. I'd say um, there are some people who, of course, maybe just don't enjoy the academics so much. So they'll go into practical stuff. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, my the way that I study and the way I learned about myself, I enjoyed to study is in sort of short blocks and yeah. uh, short focus points. I don't like the like the new version of the A-levels, I think I would have struggled a lot with where you have to study for two years to your exam right yeah, at the end. Yeah. Um, so so I, I had a decision to go to university, um, which effectively is you learning how to structure your own life and your own time and everything else, which I thought I would actually be quite bad at. Um, mm -hmm. And then the option is to, the other option was to go straight into some form of employment. So mm -hmm. I looked around, uh, it was a start of like apprenticeships uh, yep. and the start of um some of the big fours offering school leaver programs. Um, yeah. So all, yeah. all, all the big four mentioned sort of, I think they're called Flying Star, um, Bright Star and all sorts of stuff. So yeah. effectively it's uh, an alternative to going to university, but it gets you to the same position further down the line. Um, yeah. So so I applied to both. I applied to university and applied to uh, those schemes. Um, yeah. And then sort of throughout the summer after the A-levels when the results came out, um, I had uh, two applications open, one with PwC, one with Deloitte, um, mm. and I had my place at uh, Kent University uh, to, and Harriet Watt University to study accounting and finance as well. Mm. So I had the option to, to choose between the two. Okay. Um, and you went and then, there with Deloitte? Yeah, so then then I, I thought because of the way that I enjoy learning and working on the more practical side, mm. it makes sense to go straight into work and then study alongside that because... Um, the way I perceived it is you could then apply what you're learning pretty much straight away as opposed yeah, yeah, to yeah. being theoretic around <laughs> what you're learning. Talk to, just talk about that, okay, because I, 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 I yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's an interesting one because I think there's, 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 I mean, not I think there are school uh, students listening to this and, and thinking about that, like, should I do an apprenticeship? Should I do a university degree? Like, how did the studying alongside work happen? Like, uh, did you have to enroll in a university at the same time or like, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, the actual program I enrolled in, um, you study towards your chartered accountancy exam. So mm -hmm. it's a five year structured program where um, you effectively study part time and work um, full time still. So you're, you're, you're balancing the study and the work. Um, yeah. The thing is with the, the, the big accounting practices, is they are very good at giving you time off uh, to study. Um, yeah. But of course, there's an expectation for you to carry a lot of that yourself. Um, so you can ask a few of my friends during the time I was studying. I, I, I very much created a mental block between these is, these are my study hours and this is what yeah. I'm doing yeah. nine to five on a Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Um, but I didn't entirely restrict my social life. I think then you start resenting the fact that you have to study. So you have to somehow yeah, yeah, find yeah, yeah. a balance. Um, okay. And again, just, just just what works for me is working in blocks so I, I work nine to five in the library um when I wasn't work in the office and then I would go see my friends in the evening after that um and not not sort of study 24 hours a day a question is okay so that's why you picked uh apprenticeship over university um why audit because I think it's an interesting question and like I think I kind of know the answer now, but for students who, who are listening, why did you choose audit over 
maybe because you know like there's banks who do apprenticeship programs come, things yeah like that. why did you choose Deloitte and audit yeah so I mean growing up my, my uncle um is a, a chartered accountant he works for a company called Anglo Gold um a mm. mining business in um I mean all over the world really mm. uh so growing up I had conversations with him around what the job actually entailed and w- mm. what it was um and as I mentioned my parents both now teach maths so I've always had that numbers grounding and enjoy the fact that to some extent numbers uh are sort of they are what they are it's, there's not yeah, much yeah, yeah. To, to, to mess around with on, on, on that side um yeah. so I mean I, I've always wanted to get into that and I've enjoyed as I said the numbers side of things um yeah. audit specifically a number of reasons I mean if you really want to account a, a career in accountancy and a career mm-hmm. to make partner track at a big four mm. you've got that option um but mm. there's also really a really really good foundation to pivot off of as well so yeah. Yeah. the idea is that once you have an understanding of financial statements um yeah. and an in-depth understanding of financial statements um people trust you a lot more to do with operational decisions to do yeah. with budgeting processes i mean you, you can i i have friends who i um work with at deloitte who've gone on to do operations management marketing um yeah, yeah, i mean yeah. the, the variation of work is is significant from that uh, yeah. and that's just because you have a really good grounding and a really good foundation yeah um I, I mean i think with all of these big companies um unfortunately the way it works is that if they see someone sees their name on your cv they they just assume that you're a good worker and they assume that you're mm-hmm. um you you have sort of a good work ethic and and can manage people relationships everything else so yeah. um yeah, I think I picked audit mainly for the grounding. Um, I wasn't entirely sure that I wanted to become a lifetime auditor. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I think it gives you a really, really good starting point. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about exit opportunities uh, slightly later in the call. And it's interesting because, like, I think a lot of us, we fall into careers because of what family members have done, like you said, your uncle's done. And I, yeah. think, to be honest, and, and I know you're super happy and we'll talk. I, I, the question I always ask at the end is, if not audit, what else would you pursue? But like, I think it's yeah. like, like there's so many career paths out there that loads of us aren't exposed to when we're at school or at university because yeah. we're not looking at people close to us, what they've done and stuff. But we'll get onto that. So if we just move into audit a bit more specifically, because um, you mentioned... Uh, employees you worked with at Deloitte you're obviously not there anymore like but could you just talk to us what does the audit team do at Deloitte and then you've moved on since from Deloitte and like what does the audit team do where you're at now and talk uh, and maybe just talk to us about why you made that move as well yeah of course so um, I mean this is always an interesting conversation because people have a lot of assumptions around what Deloitte is as a company and what, yeah, yeah. what external audit is so I mean for specifically the team I was based in it's a company with thousands and thousands of employees the Mm. department I was based in was um, our audit and assurance department so um, mainly focusing on external audits Uh, and an external audit is effectively where a company uh, either legally or voluntarily decides to have their financial statements audited um, and then they have to have their P&L balance sheet cash flow statements audited prior to them being issued and um, sent to their shareholders or to the company's house or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, so your your job at, as an external auditor is effectively to give reasonable assurance over those statements to make sure that they are accurate and free of sort of material error. Um, yeah. okay. the, the the idea the idea the idea of materiality is something which is specific to to audit because you can't ever look at every single transaction. You're never going to be able to test a hundred percent of everything that goes on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but the idea is that you come up with a risk assessment and you come up with a audit methodology that makes sense so that you can sample whatever gives you a reasonable understanding of the statements to make sure they're correct or not. Okay. Um, so so uh, uh, that that was my this would just, role. just to be completely clear, uh, Dion. So this would be like a company like I don't know Nike coming over and saying, hey, like we've got our financial statements, we need to report, we need an auditor. I think it's legal legally they require yeah to be audited and so they come to you or pwc or whoever yeah exactly yeah so um the department i was based in was a consumer business department so our biggest customers were um and i actually had a, quite a lot of specialization in the charity sector specifically so um what we would consider to be non-standard charities something like the welcome trust which is okay. in in essence an investment fund but um legally is, is a charity charitable organization Okay. Uh, the same thing with Lloyd's Register Foundation, CAF Bank, lo- lots of sort of 
businesses which maybe the consumer wouldn't think is a charity, but legally the way they're set up and the way that they operate through giving grants and through funding research sure. are, are charities. Okay. Um, and, and, and the other customers would have been people like Tottenham Hotspur, Arsenal Football Club. Um, charities. No, no, sorry. They, they're part of the consumer business. Okay, um, okay, okay, part, okay. Part of, part of the consumer business um, department. So, okay. again, the, the, the clients you can work on is really varied. I, I know friends who are in the insurance audit market, who are in the banking audit market, who yeah. are yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in the just in the publicly listed businesses. So the variation really is endless depending on, I mean, it's you're limited by the number of types of businesses and there are, diff, I mean, millions of different yeah. types. So, um, yeah. So, so then, okay, so then you do, how, how many years are you at Deloitte for? So in total, I was at Deloitte for six years. The first five years under this study program um, yep. to qualify and finish my ACCA exams. Yep. Um, and then after that, I had an opportunity to go to Romania um, to help set up a audit delivery center. So effectively, all of the big four, and I imagine even some of the sort of other firms who are offering audit, external audit services, um, are always looking at how we can do the same thing we've always been doing, but either for less time, less money, or using less resources in the UK, mm -hmm. um, and uh, for cost-saving elements as well. And how can we implement the use of technology in helping us audit? Because the the audit world is probably a little bit behind in terms of technology advancement, just because right. you can't, if you're giving a reliance on a statement, you don't really want to be uh, trialing new technology that might not give you exactly what you need so you have to be really yeah, yeah, sure yeah. That, that it's giving you the assurance you you require as well yeah um, so i moved out to romania and the idea was to set up a uh, we called it an audit delivery center um yeah. out there um i was about the fourth guy from the uk that went over there and over the course of the year we just hired a lot of people to help um on board train it my, my job really moved from being a external auditor to being more of a operational yeah, yeah, person yeah, yeah, yeah. to try and hire and recruit and train oh, and 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 liaise with the UK as to what they required from an audit delivery center. So which services do they want us to do? Um, how can we improve our service? Um, yeah, how yeah, can yeah. we improve staff retention? All the sort of things that you, you so typically is, wouldn't this think. This is super interesting. So like, because it, it, it's kind of thing, the conversation me and you have, but like even at like the business of, we think we, we talk about how companies can grow their revenues, grow their profits. And so even for like a big four company to grow their profits, either you grow revenues or you decrease costs. And one of the ways to do that is, or two of the ways to do that is using technology to make things more efficient or outsourcing people to Romania and like these countries where it's cheaper stuff. So, okay, yeah. that's interesting. Okay. And then after your sixth year, you move from Deloitte. Talk us through why and the the destination, why it happened and things like that. Yeah, so um, after after that year in Romania, I had the opportunity to stay on there. Um, but for me, it was sort of the right time to come home um, back to the UK. I, I really enjoyed my time there, but it was sort of a, a task and it I felt like I sort of run, run, run its race and then mm. I thought I'd move on. Um, the options when you come back are effectively to integrate back into the external audit function or then, of course, look for other opportunities. At that stage, I was qualified. Mm. Um, and, and, and I had the idea that, uh, and for me, it's something just personally I enjoy doing is having variety and variation all the time mm. as well. So mm. um, I started looking, I didn't want to look too far um, away from what I was doing. I, I felt I still had a lot to learn in the control environment. And when I mentioned controls, as an external auditor, you're effectively looking at things after uh, the controls have operated. So you're looking at, at a number after the financial director of a company has done their processes and reviewed everything. Right. Whereas as an internal auditor, which is the move I ended up making to Intertech, a company called mm. Intertech, um, you still have a bit of input as to how the numbers look at the end. So you still have, uh, right. your, your job really changes that you are now involved in the processes on a day by day basis and helping to improve the, the processes which are in place, helping mm. to, spot errors or spot uh, areas where there's a potentially a weakness in our IT system or in the a review right, right, system right, right, right. or those sorts of things. So, so it, Intertech, it's very... Intertech, just give us a, a brief one liner. What does Intertech do? Because it's, it's, a, it's a massive company. Yeah, so Intertech of about 45,000 employees across the world. Um, yeah. They're a listed, listed business on the FTSE as well. Yeah. Um, the, the, the 
they don't really serve any customers, which is why no one really would have heard of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I hadn't heard I hadn't heard of them before I joined. Um, yep. Which again, for me, in a weird way, is an exciting thing because then you, yeah, you yeah. don't really know what you're getting into. Um, so the company does what they refer to as testing and certification. So any product you can think of, for example, your jumper you're wearing at some point would have had a CE mark on it somewhere, or it would have had a uh, a legal requirement to show that it's not flammable, to show that it doesn't shrink in the wash, to show that the chemicals that made the, the color green doesn't rub off on your skin. All of right. those sorts of things, J just on one product, there, there's probably around 20 or 30 tests that go into just that one jumper you're wearing. Wow. Um, right. And Intertech are the company that, uh, one of the companies that do that, that testing. Um, if you think of other things, for example, your laptop, we're having the call on here. Yeah. Um, we need to know that the battery that's in the laptop doesn't expand under heat, doesn't, um, when it goes into the into the airport, doesn't catch fire or shrink or whatever. So all, all of those things are tests that Intertech perform. Um, okay. That It was sort of founded by the idea that uh, Thomas Edison uh, invented the light bulb and uh, he couldn't practically produce enough light bulbs for the rest of the world. So he said, well, other people can start producing them, but you have to meet these standards. So okay, he effectively okay. said, well, you start producing them, but I'm going to test your light bulbs. One in every thousand that goes out, I'm going to test it and have a look and see that it meets the requirements. Okay. Um, which is effectively what the service is now that Intertech still offers. So if okay. you look on the website, there's about 30, uh, there's about 70 different businesses. Okay. Um, so oil and gas and uh, anything you can think of really. Okay, super interesting. I mean, that is fascinating actually. That I love, like, I love hearing about that kind of thing because but I had no idea. <laughs> like so much of that kind of thing happened. Like even when yeah. it makes so much sense. But um, okay. But then, so what you're doing is, let's say Intertech. I don't know. Okay, let's say the comp this company here goes Intertech. They have a contract with Intertech. They pay Intertech, and your job is looking at that revenue number that comes into financial statements. How accurate can we make that? And how accurate we make that is based on how, like you said, maybe IT processes, things like that. How everything's recorded. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give a brief context. Just let me know if I'm going into too much detail. But yeah. um, effectively, we we look at the financial controls. Um, and if you look at the word controls overall, of course, it's something which uh, is a process. So from the starting point to the ending point, what happens to that item from the start to the end? So um, yeah. we break our work into sort of five key areas. We call okay. it... Um, uh, operational controls which is effectively the pricing of a job how do we how do we determine the price that we offer to a customer mm. which individual in the business can offer a discount um, and was that discount properly approved um, okay. which terms and conditions are we offering the customer those sorts of things um, which are all to do with uh, order generation all the way through to collecting revenue so that that's the ordering side okay um, then there'll be elements such as the purchasing side which is again the opposite so how do we agree what price we're paying for our electricity or our laptops or our chemicals to test uh, your jumper, for, again, for example. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and then how do we go from generating the order to the vendor to paying the vendor? Um, and there, there's right. quite, quite a few, you could break everything down into a process or a step. So okay. if you think about uh, me ordering something online, mm. there are steps I have to go through. I look online, look for the best option. Mm. go on well go on the website maybe mm. if it's expensive ask my brother oh, do, do you want to split this between two of us yeah fine okay buy that then i have to enter my card details pay i mean there's lots of steps you can break everything yeah, down yeah, to yeah. um the, the second part or the third part sorry is to do with reporting controls so this is to okay. do with all the month end items so um if you think of financial statements there's balance sheet recs balance sheet accounts all of those things need to be reviewed and prepared properly on a monthly yep. basis um yep. and there are hundreds of controls you can think of to do with balance sheet fixed assets how do we buy fixed assets capitalize mm -hmm. um make, how do we make provisions what, whatever you can think of yeah um and then there's other elements such as it and hr as well so they're the two okay. sort of so non-financial control areas whereas how do we hire people how do we offer them con salaries how do we remove them from our it system once they've left to make sure they haven't still got access um, right, 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 right. So, so, so the the financial element becomes a lot smaller um, in 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 internal audit, um, and then you also look at other areas, like I said, the ordering, purchasing, HR, and IT. Yeah, right, right, so, right, right, right. It, it's a lot more variation. So, it's so it's super interesting. So, what, I mean, first of all, it seems like to be an auditor, you really do need to have 
a real understanding of the businesses that you're analyzing because otherwise how on earth would you be able to know all the different like controls you need to like you said need to know kind of all the steps but then i guess like what you're saying like the internal audit is looking at how do you generate those numbers on the financial statement and then the external audit what you're doing at deloitte is just checking are uh, is there any huge you know mistakes and things like that on there but then a question i have Dion is I asked Lottie this earlier who was who was who also did audit but is a thing that always surprised me well I'm not sure it surprised me anymore now but like a company like Silicon Valley Bank okay they said that they were audited a few days or a few weeks before and then the whole thing unravels there's the instances of like fraud and all these things like why do these things go undetected and like what do you think like audit companies can be doing differently yeah, I mean, I think it's very difficult to expect an audit firm to have the same level of understanding as people who are working on it day in, day out. I mean, mm -hmm. the uh, in external audit, at least, when you take over a new customer, there's mm -hmm. normally a year where um, there is an over a handover period. So mm -hmm. the old auditors would be still be doing the audit and mm -hmm. the new auditors would come in and almost shadow their work, like look at their work papers, try and get an understanding of how the business operates, um, the intricacies of that particular business. Right. Um, and then after that year of handover, you're on your own, like the new audit firm are on their own. Mm. And the, the partner ultimately takes responsibility for signing off those set, that set of financial statements. And mm -hmm. there, there's that because the statement, if you read any finance, set of financial statements, the auditor's report in there always mentions, um, it gives reasonable assurance uh, yeah, that the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That the um, statements are free of sort of material fraud or error. Mm. Um, I don't think any external audit company uh, would be able to pick up criminality automatically. I mean, there's there's not there's not an element where you're doing tests to look for criminality. Of course, you need to do tests to give you a good understanding of a cash balance the way that we look at the cash balance you go and look at the bank statement does yeah. the bank say that i have this much money in and does it agree to what the company is saying they have right. um but the, the the companies you're referring to where things have happened there's been clear evidence of criminality in the sense that someone has tried to deceive mm. and intentionally tried to deceive a, 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 another person um, and if someone wanted to do that they could yeah and it, it, it's uh, there's not really a, unless you start testing 100 percent yeah, of yeah, yeah, a particular yeah, yeah. business it's very difficult for you to stop picking up okay. that um okay. so uh, i mean the, 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 there will always be cases of fraud and historically there always has been um when there wasn't an audit rec uh, requirement there would have been cases of fraud when there is an audit requirement there would be cases of fraud mm -hmm. in america they operate under a sob oxley uh, controls yeah, model yeah. which is very stringent and very rule-based whereas the uk one at the moment is still more principle-based um yeah. so the idea is that all of these people who are committing fraud are being prosecuted and being like, do you think of Theranos re most recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, there, there's, there, there's no way to really stop it in, in its entirety. Okay. Um, but again, the partner needs to make sure that the team have done the tests that he can actually sign off and say, well, there has been, I'm, I'm reasonably sure that everything is as it should be. Okay. Um, Interesting. Um, Mate, mate, that is that's. Uh, I don't think that was too much too technical at all. I think that was brilliant, and I actually think that's something that like people even going into asset management or investment banking is good to have that kind of knowledge about how these companies work and like how audit teams like function within them and stuff. Okay, so Deloitte internal audit. I'm uh, sorry, Deloitte external audit, Intec internal audit. Maybe just talk to us. Like, what do you? What did you enjoy about the role at Deloitte? What do you enjoy about the role at Intel? What do you maybe not so enjoy about each of those roles as well? And yeah, maybe you can touch a bit about exit opportunities there. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, the the, the main word over across both jobs of is variety. Really, I mean, the, the thing mm. is, with a company such as Deloitte, you're exposed to massive businesses, really interesting contracts, really interesting discussions around like technical accounting um and and if, again for me that's something i'm interested in so i enjoy those conversations if you're not then uh yeah, yeah <laughs> you probably wouldn't, wouldn't as much but yeah. um you, you, th there's there's lots of exposure to really clever people you're also working with a really intelligent teams and working with partners who've been in the sector 20 25 years yeah. um who give you a really interesting insight um the variety for me at deloitte was really 
what I enjoyed a, a lot because I had the charity clients, which it mm. is me just like a personal interest as well. I, I enjoy, I worked on the British Red Cross and mm-hmm. it's really interesting to see what they do, how mm. they actually operate and um, speaking to people who are running projects uh, when, for example, there's an earthquake somewhere, you, you speak to the director who's running the project to, for aid relief and everything else. It's an interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and at Intertech, again, um, because you have a bit more skin in the game as an internal auditor, you, you're actually a little bit more invested in making sure that the process is run as they should do. Because yeah. uh, you're yeah. also working for the for the business. You're not a consultant. You're you're yeah. Yeah. on site and you are employed by that same company. You 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 have a bit more um, of a relationship with the business and its name. Yeah. Um, I think I, I've enjoyed working again with Intertech across. 30 different countries i've get, got to travel quite a lot you at travel a heck of a lot Dion. yeah so so the way that we i mean covid sort of changed the travel element a little bit but yeah. pre-covid um we i mean at least the business and the internal audit feel that you do a lot more on site and in person with someone so for example we would travel to germany where we have five or six different businesses in germany um, and with a team of us will go and visit every single operational site we have in Germany. Mm. And then we'll spend a week with the, the, the finance director or the regional finance person in that country mm. um, looking through the financial control. So right, again, right, you, right. Get, you get a really, really good understanding of a country. Um, I think that depends on how your business is structured. So Intertech mm. historically has been structured as being run in country. Uh, it's moving right. more to a regional management um model at the moment but do you, do you travel as much in external audit and when you when you're at Deloitte did you go to so many countries as you do at Intertech because at Intertech you're in a different country all every time I ask you yeah so I mean it depends again on which sort of customers you have in external audit um okay it, it, because ultimately in external audit you're giving assurance over us a financial statement so those financial statements typically would be published in one country only so you're you're, you're mainly looking at uh, a UK listed business or a UK uh, private company. Um, yeah. So the only reason you'll get to travel is if they have operations in other countries that you need to go and visit. And re- right. if they have um, mainly a, a sort of finance hub in a different country. Um, yeah. But the way that a lot of these big four companies operate is they have teams all over the world anyway. So you tend to just instruct a local office to do that work. Um, I, I knew some colleagues who traveled to the U S um, and I knew some, co- I traveled to Glasgow quite frequently, um, to do Red Cross, but, uh, uh, again, it just depends where the operations are, but uh, okay, not, not, makes- not, 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 not nearly as much as the internal audit. No. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And then, and then just a final question before I move on to some like softer kind of skill questions is I, I think the real value, which I never really understood to be honest about audit when I was a student is. I've seen so many people who do like their ACA qualifications, ACCA qualifications are like Deloitte, PwC and stuff. And then they can go into private equity or uh, asset management or like different or equity research and these kind of like fields because you have that qualification to say, listen, I can read financial statements really well. Yeah, That's a huge, huge bonus, no? those exit opportunities. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think, uh, as I said, I've not know lots of people who've moved into venture capital, into yeah. private equity, any anywhere you could think of really where ultimately you have to make a decision based on a set of financial inf- like information. Yeah. Um, and and I think some of the partners at these bigger private equity firms and venture capital firms value someone's opinion who can give quite unique insights to a set of financial mm-hmm. statements. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah I mean, the, the extra opportunities are massive and Again, from an internal audit perspective, the exit opportunities also become mm. a bit broader, I think, because then I'm having exposure to operational um, processes, to HR, yeah. to IT. So yeah. I've, I've known people who've moved out into the operational teams, um, become sort of local uh, managers for oper- on the operational side, um, right. have, moved, have moved all the way into regional controller roles. Uh, CF- I, I mean, our, our CFO uh, is... is a guy who's been in the company a long, long time and he's held many, many different roles in the business. So um, the variety and the, the breadth of your understanding becomes a lot more important. Um, and that's something I'd say to anyone looking to get into work in general, if even if it's not accounting or anything else, mm. a lot of the really successful people I speak to in our company have had many different roles and haven't mm. been scared to try something new. Mm. Um, so, so I think making yourself a little bit uncomfortable in a new role is sometimes worth it for the long-term payoff you'll, you'll get from that as well. Okay. Okay. Super interesting. Um, 
Okay, D, so I'll, I'll move to the, some slightly uh, softer questions. I appreciate the technical aspect, but any kind of, uh, yeah, let's start with this. Any any books that you've read that since university that you'd, oh, sorry, since school where you would tell a younger Dion to maybe have read a bit earlier, whether their work or their, or their play? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't read too many, like, a, a a technical accounting books uh, to, to, to sort of relax. I think my work is <laughs> is that side of things. Uh, I really enjoy reading uh, a variety of books. My my favorite one probably uh, that I read most recently was something called Factfulness. Um, oh, and that's that's just to do with uh, giving you a bit of context around the state of the world and giving you a, some, sometimes I think that we get too caught up in our little reality of what's going on right ahead of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, having a wider lens and a perspective is is very important. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, think, I think moving I think that helps with like. Um, yeah, I talk a lot about commercial awareness, and like a lot of people who come on do talk to, um, the career talks talk about commercial awareness. But just like having awareness about the world around us, yeah. like incredible. I, I'm I'm glad you said factfulness because a lot of people come on and say books I've never heard of. So I'm actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll see if you heard of the next one. The next one is, um, uh, as, as I'm sort of moving on in my career, I think uh, something I'm becoming more aware of is uh, variation in personalities, variation in people management side as well. So um, I'm currently reading a book uh, called Maverick uh, by Ricardo Semler. Um, it's, it's a guy uh, who inherited a business from his dad in Brazil. Um, and he as the name suggests, was quite maverick in the way he approached the management style of the company. Um, as, as sort of a high level point, it's a lot about empowering employees, um, releasing decision making from the hierarchy and pushing it down into the organization itself. Um, and, and sort of getting employees to buy into the way uh, that things work. So for, as an example, they get to, there's, there's a 4% pay rise this year. The employees get to split it themselves across. So some people might get five percent, six, seven percent. Some employees because they haven't been that good might get one or two percent. So it, it was very interesting. It's still a, I'm not finished with it yet. It's a very interesting book to to give you context around how to motivate your employees and how to get them to to feel sort of bought into the business itself. Okay. Um, and, okay. And I think that's that's something again overall is really important. Is that what I've learned so far uh, is that especially in the external audit as well, mm. the amount of people that come out of university and study accounting and finance, they get into external audits quite limited, to be honest. The amount of people that study history, English, um, geography, um, and then get hired by a company such as Deloitte um, is, is actually quite a lot because mm. I think those companies value the variation in thought and they value yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the people who come in with different perspectives. They're not trying to hire robots who are really good at numbers and trying to hire people who are well-rounded and yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. have a really good perspective of the world itself and we look for the same thing when we're hiring here for example as well i mean that's an interesting question because it kind of leads on to what i was going to ask next next is are there any kind of like courses or like technical skills you advise uh students at university or at school who wanted to get into audit because like you said like so many people come from non finance kind of backgrounds so I'm, yeah. I'm doing things like financial modeling and doing all of that is not necessary you don't need to do the ACA or start any of that at uni or school so like, what kind of things would you advise would you advise them to do you look at YouTube videos of financial statements and stuff or no yeah I mean I think I think having a there's not an expectation to have an understanding of financial statements uh when you join a company such as Big Deloitte I mean they they teach you that that's the intention uh, your first yeah. couple of years is really getting to grips with what that is yeah. Um, what what I'd suggest people doing is the soft skill side of things. So more to mm. do with uh, presentation skills, um, mm. to do with uh, communication, to do with uh, problem resolution, all of those things, mm. which which you probably don't think of as being a key skill. Um, mm. It is very important to to build relationships with people and make mm -hmm. them but like, make you a trustworthy person as well so yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's more the a course i enjoyed a lot when i was at deloitte was um a presentation skills we i used to offer training to the to the new employees and that, that again is really enjoyable because you have to figure out how to pitch your idea to different levels and to different people levels of understanding as well and that that's helped me a lot in my current job where i present my audit reports to yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The, the the accountant in country doing the work all the way up to our CEO CFO who are trying to interpret what that actually means practical in, in practical terms. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah the it's, soft skills so side is very important. 
it's so interesting how important presentation skills are in in any kind of career because like yeah. even, like in your career it's trying to get your ideas across to different levels for my career in asset management it was trying to pitch to a portfolio manager it doesn't matter how good your analysis was yeah you buy the stock you, you know you don't going to reap the benefits so you need to actually yeah. uh, present that and get communicate that well um yeah okay perfect Dion, I, I want to particularly maybe focus this question, uh, well, your response, maybe tailor it slightly to school students who are in year 12, year 13, who are doing the A-levels, like who, who maybe want to follow a similar kind of career path. What advice would you give them? Because you've you've done that, you were there 10 years ago, like what kind of things would you uh, tell them that maybe you would advise to do slightly different or things that you def- they definitely should do that you've done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think some students and I've helped a couple of recent people like trying to get into the sector. And what I find a lot is that um, everyone focuses a lot on the academic side of things. And of course mm-hmm. it's important to have strong academics and to have the, the the sort of minimum requirements and the higher above that you are, the more likely your application moves to the next stage. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I tell people is that the companies, as I said, are not trying to hire the same block mold of person. They're trying to hire variation um, and it, it, somehow try and get your personality across in what you do. So um, have interests outside of work, have interests mm. such as, I don't know, sport or chess club or debate, whatever you yeah, want yeah, it yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, have an interest in that, um, which and, and, and really find something which you really enjoy doing. Mm. Um, work is an important element and academics is an important element, but mm. ultimately what I think good managers look for is variation. So you need people who have different skills and um, well-rounded people. Yeah, exactly. From different yeah. backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. in, in our internal audit team in Intertech, we don't have two people that are from the same country. I mean, we're, we're, we hire almost intentionally people who are from different backgrounds and that helps you a lot when you're trying to solve a problem, have different points of view and have different trains of thought as well. So um, I, I'd say to school students, really try and branch out your area of what you enjoy doing not the academic side specifically but right. outside of that and and in your personal statement write something personal don't write a a, a sort of a, a, a cut and paste thing that you found from somewhere mm. else it is mm. meant to be about you and if if a recruiter reads it and sees oh wow this person actually comes across as an individual yeah, yeah i'm yeah, sure yeah, your yeah. will get and, a lot more attention and if you're doing other extracurricular things you can always kind of frame that in a way that is going to help you in your job like for sure i I play sports which is going to help my time management because i've had to manage that with exams or leadership or teamwork like yeah i I always tell people like at the end of the day the person hiring you is is thinking can i sit five days next to this person in the office like you need to to be a decent person an all-rounded person okay dion last question and it's kind of what i mentioned earlier is if not audit like Obviously, you 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 enjoy numbers. You you were kind of brought into that, not brought into it. Like the idea kind of came up from speaking to your family and stuff. But ten years on, like, what other careers would you have pursued if not audit? And I think we've got about a minute left before the Zoom shuts off. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, probably just as erratic as my A level choices, it would be something very quite strange, something quite practical. Um, yeah. I I did a summer working as a tree surgeon. Um, uh, tree surgeon. <laughs> Yeah, tree surgeon. I really enjoyed that. Um, so that 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 would be something that would be on the list. Um, if, okay. if more sort of professional piece of work, then uh, I think I quite enjoy the idea of getting into like the startup space. So probably more okay. to do with smaller businesses, um, having a I don't know a freedom to think and generate new ideas. Okay, um, would, would be something that would be very interesting. So two very different answers there, but uh, okay, yeah. nice mate. Um, mate, that's all the questions I have. Uh, Big D, thanks so much for your uh, time. Really, really appreciate it. I'm sure this will have loads of students looking to get into audit. And yeah, thanks for your time, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers, mate.